Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zed from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am joined by a dear friend of mine, Sharif Adams. Sharif, how are you doing? Good thanks Zed, always enjoying your company. You're really very lovely. kind, thank you. Well I've spent a couple of days with Sharif, I turned my first ever wooden bowl and what this video you're about to watch now is a part two to a series. In part one, we covered the lathe itself, the wooden bowl, uh, the types of woods you can use, the tools that are used, etc, etc, as well as having a bit of an in-depth look at Sharif as an actual maker. If that video you haven't already seen, I will put a link below should you want to go and check that out. What that video does, that gives a very solid foundation to what you're about to see now. Now in this video, Sharif Adams, a full-time uh, professional turner and teacher, is going to be teaching you from absolute start to finish on how to turn a wooden bolt on a pole lathe. Now, as you can see from the length of this video, this is a very long video. That is because there are a lot of steps involved to get from start to finish. And what Sharif Adams has very kindly allowed me to do is come into his workshop in Dartmoor here in the southwest of England on a beautiful day is to document that entire process. Now, one thing we have done is we have timestamped all the sections below uh, in this video, should you wish to jump to that particular section throughout the entire making process. A second thing we've also done, and this was referenced in the first video, is Sharif Adams has very kindly put together a very detailed blog post listing all the paraphernalia that surrounds the wooden bowl. For example, the lathe, the tools, etc. How you can go about acquiring those yourself, where to buy them, how to build them, and so forth. So that blog post is a very detailed blog post that Sharif has written that accompanies this entire video series. So a link to that I would also put down below and I would highly encourage you to go and check that out. So I hope you enjoy the rest of this video where Sharif Adams is going to be teaching you how to turn a wooden bowl on a pole lathe. So Sharif, could you give an indication in this tutorial what we're going to be turning? Yeah, we're going to make a simple wooden bowl, something like this. Um, and we're going to start with some uh, a blank. I'm going to show you how to rough out the, the blank with an axe. And then we'll get the blank on the lathe. And hopefully we'll have a wooden bowl. And fingers crossed you'll be able to have a go at doing this yourself with the help of a video. And in part one to this series, we've had a detailed look at a lot of examples of wooden bowls, the types of woods to use, etc. Uh, so once again, to stress the worth, go check that out. Yep. So in terms of the section of wood you're going to be carving with, what are you going to be carving with then? Well, we're turning rather than carving, um, but we're going to be turning out of, uh, we're actually going to turn the bowl out of this piece of wood. Now, there's a reason that I'm doing that. Usually, um, making a bowl like this would come out of half a log like that. So you could get two bowls out of a, a, an end of a log like this. Um, and this is what I would advise you to do. The reason I'm not doing that is I haven't got any wood this size that's suitable. This, I did get some small diameter logs specifically for this purpose for you to be here filming today. But we've noticed that there's some beetles that have been getting in here and it's just it's no good at all for turning. So, um, but I just wanted to show you that normally what you would do is take a log a little bit bigger, maybe not quite as big as this, a little bit bigger than the diameter of the bowl you're going to turn, split it in half. And the first most important thing you must do is split away or axe away um, the first section where the pith is, this material down the middle, this old, old material here. Because if any of that pith material is left in your bowl as it dries, there's a very, very high likelihood it's going to crack. Okay? So split along here, discard this material, a good sort of you know four or five growth rings from the centre at least. And then I would split off a section at the back as well and discard that, or you could use that to make some spoons with. And then you're left with a slab down the middle, which will look something like that, although you'll have a little bit of bark at each edge. The reason I'm using this piece today is because I tend to now buy large diameter timber because of some of the other products that I make. And um, I, I mentioned a little bit about this in the other video. Uh, so this is, this is what I'm going to use today. And you can make a bowl this way as well. It's just a larger diameter piece of timber that's split radially. Um, simple as that, and that's gonna. I'm, I'm gonna now turn that into a bowl plank with my axe. And what wood is this? That we've this is with? beach. This is beach. Yeah. And this is your prefer, typically. It's what I like to use more than anything else. Um, I mentioned a bit in the other video that uh, different types of timber you can use, any sort of hardwood you can use really for bowl turning. Um, but my preference is beach. Yeah. Now that we have our timber selected, what's the next part? 
Okay, so I'm just going to scribe a circle here. So I'm going to locate the centre by just checking that this is roughly the same spacing at each end, first of all, here and here. And then more or less at the sides. I'm going to lose a little bit off the edges there. So let's bring that a little bit closer to the edge. There's no need to go right to the very edge, but get relatively close. And then I'm just going to scribe a circle there. Hopefully the camera can pick that up. Yep, that's looking good. Okay, so that's my circle scribed on now. And uh, I'll split the sides off now to bring these sides in. And this is especially important when you're using half a log. Um, when you split this out of half a log, you'll have some bark at this edge and this edge. And a sort of uh, uh, a sweeping edge like this on here. So I always try to cut the log off the trunk before I split it in half, slightly shorter along its length than the diameter of the log itself, so that I can split some of the sides off like I'm about to do now. And if there's any sort of, if one side of the log is a lot shallower than the other where the bark is, that means that you can square that up and true it up. And it, does, it means you haven't got a low point when you come to turn the bowl. So I'm just going to split off the excess now. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have used axes before, but for anyone that hasn't, the safe way to do this is to make sure that you're standing side on. So when you hit the axe with the mallet, it's going to swing out away from you, as opposed to if I was standing like this, it would swing uh, into my leg. So just try and keep, keep working safely all the time. Fine for that side. Okay, so that's pretty good. Don't need to go right up to the line, that's fine for the next stage. Okay, okay, so next, um, I'm going to start taking off corners now. I want to take off the four corners and I want to go from roughly from the middle of this line to the middle of this line, across like that at an angle. And I'm going through about 45 degrees or so, and I'm going to sort of come out roughly there at that corner. And I'm just going to do that nice and easy. Um, it's really important if you're not used to using an axe to take your time with this. And especially important, obviously, to keep your fingers and thumbs well out of the way of where the axe is. Uh, I'm using a chopping block that's got this sort of raised end to it which helps to offer support there and gets the angle pretty much where I want it to be. Okay, so that's the first corner.
So that's how it should look like more or less after the first two corners are off. Just repeat on the other side. Sorry, Seth, I'm covering you in wood chip here. <laughs> Sorry, shrapnel. <laughs> Okay, so so that's the other corner done. So that's more or less how it should look when the four corners are taken off. Okay, so I'm going to take the, these corners off now. Um, you can see that the fibres of the wood are going this way. That's the way the grain is running. So I'm now going to be cutting across the end grain, which is quite hard work. Um, this isn't particularly green, this, or freshly, you know, this has been sort of down for quite a long time, so it should turn quite nicely. The, 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 the more fresh the wood is, um, the fibres can get a bit fluffy sometimes when you're turning. If it's had a chance to mellow, some of the, some of the moisture's had a chance to leave the wood, it's in a better condition for turning, the fibres cut more cleanly. So I'm expecting this to turn well, but we'll just have to see. But it does mean that roughing it out is a little bit harder than if it was very green. Um, I should also say that the dimensions of this piece of wood, this is about seven inch diameter, this circle. And it's about, I started with a slab that was about three inches thick, just in case anybody was thinking about measurements and stuff. So, so these are the end grain corners now, and I, I'm aiming to go from, a, if, if this is the centre point, I'm aiming to go from about here to somewhere between, about halfway between the centre and here, maybe not, just a little bit shy of halfway. There's lots of different ways of roughing out a blank. Um, this is a way that I've found, a lot of people email me and ask me questions about how do I rough out a blank and get the blank nicely balanced before, put, before I put it on the lathe. Because you can put anything on the lathe really and start to turn it, but the closer to an even symmetrical balanced shape it is, the easier it's gonna be when you start turning it. So we're not looking for perfection, uh, we're just trying to get something that's easy to turn. And this way of roughing out it's quite a methodical way of doing it. I found it's an easy way for people to do it when they've never done anything like this before. Hopefully it'll be fairly straightforward. Um, so this corner now is coming off. And I'm going more or less the same angle I did with these, but maybe not quite so steep. Okay, so I'm going, I don't know what that is, about an inch or so. An inch or so to the, to the end, just like that is fine. I'll do the same thing on the other side. Okay, so that's the two ends taken care of. And now we've got the sides, which we need to be a little bit careful across. Here we've been going straight across the end of the fibres. 
when we come to these corners, we need to be a little bit careful because we're going across and it would be easy to split out too much. So you can either just take your time and do a little bit at a time like this, or you can even put it on its end and come straight down. Try and get the angle that you want like that. We're looking to go more or less the same sort of depth as we did at the end, so somewhere around about an inch or so around the boundary there. Same on the other side. Again, just making sure that fingers are well out of the way of where you're working and that the blank is nicely supported on the block as well. We don't, don't want things wobbling around too much as far as possible. So there we go. That's um, the, the corners initially taken off and all the sides as well. So you're looking at something resembling a vague sort of square or rectangle on the top. Um, now what I'm going to do is come back and take these corners off again, sort of where, the, where I started initially, I'm going to come back and take this off, so I'll end up with something resembling, sort of resembling an octagon is the idea, on the top. Okay, well I went a little bit far in that corner, but it doesn't matter really, that's fine. Um, so now what I'm going to do, now that I've got quite thin here on these corners, it's going to be a lot easier for me to take off the corners with the axe. There's various different ways you can do this. Some people I've seen use a saw to take the corners off, which is absolutely fine. Um, if, if, you, if I can use just one tool instead of reaching for another, I usually do. I'm spinning this around now just so you can see how I use the top of this to help support and cut when I'm working on the corners. makes life a lot easier to be able to rest it on there while I'm taking that off. And this gets increasingly harder as the corners disappear because it all starts to wobble around a little bit. What I'm trying to do when I take the corners off is keep this edge more or less square to the front. It's tempting when you're taking the corner off to do this. You're looking at this line and the axe can come around and you can get a sort of a, um, a chamfered type edge. It's better to avoid that if possible. Keep everything quite square and blocky. Um, this next corner you won't be able to see but I'm supporting it in the same way. I've shifted my leg back a little bit just so I'm more comfortable and I can
and see what I'm doing. So that's the corner there. Not necessary to go right up to the line, you know. Once it's on the lay, that actually all sort of turns away quite quickly. It's just, like I said, trying to get it more or less symmetrical and balanced so it's not wobbling around too much. This is, we're going straight across all the fibers here, straight across the end grain. It's quite hard work. Do and this is the last corner. It's always the hardest one because there's nothing left to support it on the block with, so I sometimes try and lock it against the block of my body. You do need to be careful when you're working like this with the axe, with your body close. Um, it would be very easy to, to, to miss what you're doing and with the axe to end up in your, in your body. So, um, you know, if you're not used to using an axe, just do all of this really slowly and carefully and take your time. Work, always work in the middle of your chopping block, don't work too close to the edge. Okay, so that's the corners off. And now I'm just gonna go around and tidy up a little bit of this by taking off those, those high points left from the, what I did earlier. I'm just gonna go and run some of them, run down them with the ax. Just going around, knocking down those high points to try and smooth it all out a little bit. That's more or less a blank, hopefully fairly balanced, ready to go on the lathe. So with the blank axed out, what's the next part in the process? So next we need to attach the drive shaft to the blank. This is the piece of wood which the cord on the lathe is going to be wrapped around and that's going to make the work spin so that we can turn it, we can cut it with the tool. And this is called a mandrel. It's basically a drive shaft, like I say. And there's various different forms that you can use for these mandrels. Um, you can attach it in a number of ways. This is a tenon mandrel. So it's a mandrel with a tenon on the end. You would drill a hole here, that's slightly smaller than the tenon, and hammer that into the hole so that it's a really tight fit. And then you pick the two up together and take them to the lathe. Um, I do use tenon mandrels for smaller things that I'm making, cups and stuff, uh, but I find that for bowls I prefer to use um, a spiked mandrel and this one has had a, a good sort of few years use, but they're very very easy to make. It's just a, a cylinder that's turned um, and then what I do, there's various different ways you can do this, different makers have different ways of doing this, but I just make holes in, drill little pilot holes in, and then screw screws into it. And the screws I use have got a section before the head with no thread. So I'll, I'll bury the screw all the way in until the threaded section goes, and then the section that's left um, without any thread is, is what protrudes. And I then cut the top of the screw off, 
and the head of the screw off and just file it into rough points, very rough and ready. What I always do though is make a center mark and put one in the center which is slightly taller than the three around the edge. And that is so that I can, when I've scribed my circle on, there's always a, uh, a point here from scribing the circle that tells me the exact dead center of my blank. And that raised one in the center, that raised spike, very easily locates into that center. So I don't have to faff about sort of trying to eyeball and work out where the middle is. Ways around that, if you don't have a raised center, is to, um, you know, scribe, when you scribe the circle here, scribe a smaller circle, which you can then sort of eyeball down the, the mandrel and just try and get it centered. Um, but I just find that really quick and easy. And the reason I prefer a spike mandrel is I don't have to have a drill. I don't have to drill a hole in each time. It's just blank made, mandrels ready, bang, in it goes. And worth mentioning that in the blog post that accompanies this video series, uh, you have a link where people can get hold of that. If, you know, because I know you make them from time to time, don't I you? I do make, I mean, I don't, I don't, as a rule, make a lot of mandrels, but people have asked me to make them uh, from time to time. And if you're not able to make one yourself, then do get in touch and have a look at that blog post. I'll put a link on where you can get in touch if you need, a, if you need one made up, yeah. Perfect. So this now goes into the blank, is that correct? Yeah, so I'll just move this chopping block out of the way. And I'm going to hammer this in now. So, centre spike located there into the, into the middle of the blank. And an obvious thing to state, but you're obviously trying to keep this as, as perpendicular to the... Keep it straight as possible. Um, what, one thing I didn't say, which is worth mentioning, is the area here on the blank that I'm hammering the, the mandrel into, I've taken a little bit of care with my axe just to get that flat and level. Because if you've got a raised high point somewhere here where the mandrel's going to hammer in um, as it's spinning on the lathe it can start to work loose you know if you've got like a ridge running along there so just take a bit of time to get this it doesn't have to be dead flat but just flat as possible you don't want to have like a mountain range running along the top of there um, so yeah and then this just gets hammered in hammered in flush like that so you can't see any gap really you don't want it to be sticking out it could work loose the length of those spikes are relatively sort of um, are sort of relevant as well if the spikes on the mandrel if the tangs or the spikes are too short it can easily start to work loose um, if they're too long then you have to be careful when you're undercutting and hollowing out here creating the core which is later snapped out because you'll have metal spikes sticking through it all the way through, you know. So um, just be a little bit careful not to not to misjudge the length of your your mandrel spikes. So Sharif, with the mandrel attached, what's the next part of the process? So we need to now mount this on the lathe uh, and get it centered. So. And it's worth mentioning that in the previous video we did have an in-depth look at your lathe and the tools that we're about to use. Sure. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So, to centre this on the lathe, I'm going to put the mandrel into the left hand centre and then this one which is loose, this poppet is fixed in place, this one which is loose, I'm just going to offer it up where I think it's going to be spinning centrally and if you can see the mandrel at the moment, it's going up and down. If you look at the mandrel, you can see it's off centre, so I want to change that. To do that, I bring it to its highest point and then drop it down slightly on this left hand centre here to move the spike slightly lower and spin it again and see and that's looking better still slightly off so to me that's looking good enough I mean it doesn't need to be perfect it's a little bit off still but that'll do that'll do just fine so then I just give this a little tap with my trusty lump hammer and there we are, good to go. So from that point, I'm now going to attach the, uh, the, the cord, which powers the whole thing. And I do that by putting the mandrel behind the cord from where I'm standing. So the cord is between me and the mandrel. I then wrap the cord around by pushing it to my left hand side and around. And then I'll 
roll that down, place it between the centres again, give it a tap, and then I'm hitting this wedge home down here. And that should hold the whole thing. So two questions if I may, yeah. actually. Um, lubricant, in yep. where, the, where it holds uh, onto the mandrel, etc. Um, do you use any lubricant? Um, I don't initially. I mean, it's probably good practice to use something on the, on the metal sensors because they do generate a bit of heat. If I notice anything starting to squeak annoyingly or it looks like anything's getting too hot or drying out, you can use something to lubricate it, like something like a drop of Vaseline or a little bit of oil. Um, yeah, anything you like really, anything that will, that will help the friction not to um, get things too hot. But most of the time on a bowl like this I don't bother because it doesn't take a huge amount of time to turn it. So. And also a second question if I may, regarding your cordage, uh, a conversation we had off camera, you use yeah. a particular type of cord don't you? For yeah, I mean it's, it, this is something called chrome nylon belting, it's a bit of a posh bit of leather really, it's like a laminated piece of leather with a central nylon core. It's, it's just something that I've used, someone mentioned it years ago to me. Um, I started off using stuff like paracord and things and because of the friction it always goes, it fails, it breaks, you happen to replace it a lot. And um, someone mentioned this stuff so I bought some and it's just amazing. It's not cheap, uh, it's made by a company called Chiarino and they do drive belts for machinery and stuff. So yeah, it's called chrome nylon belting. It's, um, it's pretty much indestructible as long as you don't cut it with something sharp it will I'm not entirely sure how long it would last if it was outside in the rain a lot because it could start to delaminate but as long as you're inside in a workshop or in a covered space it's it's just going to last you for years and years and years so yeah that's that's what I use people sometimes use old conveyor belt straps uh, old conveyor belt material that they cut up into strips you could just use a bit of leather I suppose um, uh, and a lot of people are quite happy using paracord and stuff like that as well but it does fail from time to time. So. Thank you. So that's spinning. I'm happy with how that is now. That's, that's looking fine. What should people be looking out for with the spinning? Should there be a certain amount of tautness or? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good point, actually. So setting up the lathe you're set f for your own personal um, preferences are it's all just down to a matter of how you are with your body and how it all feels um, and you know you don't want this treadle to be such hard work with the tension on the bungee or the pole whatever you're using for your spring you don't want it to be so tight that it's exhausting but at the same time if it's too slack then what you'll find is the return will be quite slow so you'll push down it'll be very easy to push down but then it'll come up quite slowly and it's difficult to then get into a rhythm. I, I personally like it to be a little bit responsive, a little bit snappy. So there's a little bit of tension there. You know, I'm having to work a bit with my left leg, but not overly. You don't want to exhaust yourself. Um, you know, there's all sorts of little things with the lathe in terms of setup for your body height. People say that when you stood on the floor, the centre should be more or less in line with your, you know, nipple height, people say, you know, roughly speaking. Um, the bed of this lathe is a little bit higher than my waist, but all the measurements for this are going to be on that blog post that I write. And also I've noticed you stand on a piece of table yeah, as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I was just about to say, so people say, well, why, don't, why do you stand on a block when you're at the lathe? And um, the reason is, if I'm standing on the floor, you want to get as, as much travel on the treadle as possible, which, because that increases the number of revolutions the bowl is spinning, which makes cutting more efficient. If I'm stood on the floor, to get the lathe treadle to come up so I'm getting a good amount of travel, it means lifting my leg very high up and down, which is quite hard work. It's like doing this sort of exercise. It's exhausting. So if I bring myself a little bit higher, then I'm still getting the same amount of travel, but it's, it's much easier to push down with my leg than it is to lift my leg up high each time. So um, it, it's, it's to do again with just... Um, making things work efficiently and being comfortable with your body, not over overstraining your body unnecessarily. So with the piece mounted, what's the next part of the process? So we begin now by shaping the back and the, the initially what we're doing is roughing out with the tool, with the turning tool, the hook tool, all of these axe facets. We've got lots of high points and low points, mountains and valleys all over the surface here. So initially we're going to be knocking back those high points getting everything to connect with the turning tool, 
and then um, and then shaping the the outside profile of the bowl that you want. <coughs> And so with that one, what tools are you going to be using? So for that, primarily I use this, uh, what I call a tip-up tool, which is a hook tool that's got the cutting edge with the tip pointing up. The cutting edge is on the left side, so it's got a bevel, a blade on the left, and no blade at all on the other side. Um, I should also say that the tools I make have got an inside bevel only. I don't use any outside bevel tools at all. They're all inside bevel. It's just what I find works better. Um, I found that I can, uh, they're more responsive to what I want them to do. An outside bevel tool can sometimes follow contours in the wood in a way that I don't want it to, whereas a, a, an inside bevel tool sort of behaves itself, essentially. And, and once again, in the blog post, we've linked to the tools specifically. So you can find out more information about the tool design and possibly where to get hold of them yourself. Yeah, absolutely. W what I'm doing now is putting my, my glasses on. These are just my reading glasses. I would recommend that people wear some sort of safety glasses when they're turning, um, especially when they start hollowing the inside, you can get a lot of confetti flying up in your face, uh, but it could happen at any point that a shaving flies up and cut, gets into your eye, which at, the, you know, at best can be inconvenient and uncomfortable, uh, at worst could actually be um, potentially you know, quite a nasty thing to happen. A friend of mine had, a, as he was hollowing a bowl, he caught the rim and the bowl sort of exploded a little bit, <laughs> bits flew up and uh, a, a chip came up very, very fast and quite close to his eye actually cut him, so cut his cheek, which if that had hit his eye would have been quite a nasty accident. So I would recommend you wear some sort of protection over your eyes, even if they're just reading glasses or some sort of safety glasses as well. So um, I just want to talk through, first of all, what, what's going on when we're turning. There's quite a lot going on. It's quite, a, there's a, it's quite a complicated interplay of various things that are happening. So, obviously, for a right-handed turner, such as myself, I'm standing on my right leg on the block, and my left leg is operating the treadle, and that's powering the whole thing. And that movement wants to be automatic. Eventually, you don't want to be thinking about that at all. You want to have enough speed and momentum uh, for everything to work well. If it's going too slowly, you won't, you'll find it doesn't work quite as well as if there's a bit of speed and momentum. But equally, you don't want to be going so fast that you're becoming unbalanced because it's important that your upper body is balanced and stable so you can have good control of the tool. So the left leg, getting a comfortable amount of revolutions, not going all the way down to the floor each time or coming all the way up. Just something where you're getting, you want to be looking at about two and a half revolutions of the bowl each, with, it, with each treadle. My left arm then is resting on this, which is the tool rest. Here is the tool rest support, that's what the tool rest su is supported by, and my arm rests on the tool rest. And that's another way of uh, supporting my upper body, keeping myself steady and balanced, so I've got control of the tool. And my weight is shifted slightly forward onto that arm. It's a bit like leaning at a bar, having a chat with someone at the bar. That's the sort of position you want to be in, comfortable like that. My left hand, fingers of my left hand and my thumb go round the tool rest. And depending on what part I'm cutting on, some, either two fingers like this or sometimes one finger, sometimes uh, all four fingers are round the tool itself locked in place by my thumb and some of the other fingers of that hand. And that helps, to, again, to steady and guide and control the tool through the cut. My right hand is doing an awful lot of other things. It's doing what I, I, can, I call the twist or rotation, so twisting like this or like this. And what that does, if you look at the end of the tool, is it moves the cutting edge up or down. So I could have the cutting edge pointing at the sky or pointing at the floor or I can have it horizontal or anywhere between. Now if the cutting edge is pointing up at the sky generally speaking that's extremely aggressive for most of the cuts. Some of the cuts it's a very, I'll explain, a very fine cut but for most of the turning we're doing that's very aggressive and you want to avoid that. Down at the ground is completely useless, it's not going to do anything, it's just going to rub on the back of the tool. So if you're unsure at any point, I always advise people to start with the cutting edge down and work your way up while the bowl's spinning until it just starts to engage and then you know that's roughly the right place. It's often horizontal or close to 45 degrees where it starts to cut, sometimes just before that. So that's the twist. This hand also um, offers up the tool at different angles 
according to how far away the handle is held from your body. So if the handle is held a long way from my body, the back of the tool is sitting quite flat here against the surface so from working on, the, on this part of the bowl, the base of the bowl or this edge. And as I work around that shape, the handle comes closer and closer to me to keep the back of the tool in that position so it's taking a nice cut. So that position here, the handle in relation to my body, is constantly changing depending on what part of the outside of the bowl I'm working on. And that's really important. The, the optimum angle for a nice cut is for the back of the tool to be sitting quite close to flat against the surface. If it's completely flat against the surface, it's not going to be doing very much at all. But it's very, very close to completely flat against the surface, just slightly closer into your body. So as well as the twist and this position, the right hand can also raise the handle higher or drop the handle lower. And that brings the cutting edge lower down or higher up on the surface of the bowl that you're cutting. And that will dictate wh which part of this hook is cutting. So I lift, if I lift the handle up very high, I'm going to be cutting with the top part of that hook. If I drop the handle lower down, it'll be working, cutting more here. And I tend to work around the top sort of third, this sort of area, most of the time when I'm shaping the back of the bowl, sort of the front to the, the, the tip. Um, this hand is also responsible for something that I call pulsing. And that's a very subtle movement backwards and forwards in time with my treadle. So when I push down with the treadle, the tool comes into the surface and takes a cut. And that's time together. So the, the, the tool meets the wood as I'm pushing down. When I lift my foot up, the tool just comes away just very slightly. It's a very subtle movement. It's really not backwards and forwards like this. It's just away and in. It's just a very slight... And it's a little bit, I think of it like an axe chopping. If you were to take an axe and, and try and shape a piece of wood by holding the, the, the head of the axe and pushing it through the wood, it would cut, but it wouldn't be very efficient. It would be very hard work. So when you use the axe, and that, where there's a bit of momentum uh, and speed, it helps the axe to work efficiently. And it's the same when I'm using this cutting tool. I find it works better if there's a slight pulsing movement in time with my treadle. And that's a very difficult thing for a beginner bowl turner to get the hang of because there's so much going on. But it's worth mentioning because I feel like it's a really important part of uh, making the tool work efficiently. So finally, the final thing I'm going to talk about before I, I show you how it all works is that I, it's one of the most important things to do is to have control of the tool. And I find the best way to have control of the tool is to make the tool move through an arc, a fixed arc. So I, you can think of it as, a as if there's a nail that goes through the tool here into the tool rest and the tool can only move through that arc, that fixed arc, like a pivot point. So I do a lot of cuts, a series of cuts, many different arcs, one after the other after the other, each time moving slightly further along the tool rest, repositioning and having another pass through an arc. And that allows me to do that pulsing movement and I know that each time I bring the tool back, it's going to come back into exactly the same place it was. So I can go away and come back into the cut knowing it's going to be accurate and precise. If I wasn't moving through that arc, I'd be jumping around all over the place. Uh, the re another reason for doing that arc, as well as control, especially on the back of the bowl, is that if I'm trying to create the shape that I want by sort of steering the tool into the curve, I'm very likely to end up digging in or getting these deep steps and gouges all the way through it. An arc allows you, if you aim, if you line it up correctly, so it's a sort of a, a nice shallow arc over the surface, knocking back the high points, it allows you to smooth out the axe work by knocking back the high points, but always ending up steering away from the surface. And a repeated series of arcs like that will shape the bowl and knock back the high points in a much safer, more controlled way than if you're trying to steer it into the curve you think the bowl should be. So this is, um, we've got a really uneven surface here. I've got quite a big low point here and I'm going to just start to knock all of this back over several passes over the whole thing and smooth it all out. So, so I've got my hands, my left hand locking the tool nice and strongly against the, the tool rest. My right hand's in position, bracing 
quite quite a firm hold, not overly, but strong, so that I'm able to um, move the tool in the direction I want. And I'm going to make a forward sweeping pass this way. And it's a tip so pointing up, yeah? The tip, initially, I'm, I'm just offering it up just at a slight downward angle, so I know it's not going to be too aggressive. If, if I point it right down at the floor now, you, just so you can see, it's going to be rubbing on the back of the tool. It's going to be doing nothing at all. And as I start to twist up slightly with my right hand, you can see now the tool is just starting to cut. So I know that's more or less the right angle. And now I can slowly begin to move the tool forward through that arc. Okay, so that's one pass finished. And I'll just repeat that now. I've moved the, the tool slightly along the tool rest, so I'm just getting ready for another pass. Just knocking back those high points. This is the third pass now. So if we see what we've done so far, we've been cutting here, from here to here, that's three passes, and I've still got a couple of axe facets here that haven't been touched, so that's the low point, that's where I took a little bit too much off that corner. So I'm going to keep moving forward, I've slid the tool further along the tool rest, I'm lining up for another arc, which is going to be like that. Each arc sort of more or less goes through just where the last arc ended, you could line it up through the middle of the last arc, but more or less where the last arc left off is a pretty good place to start. And that subtle pulsing movement I was talking about, in time with my downward treadle, don't know if you can see it there, it's just a very subtle away and back with the tool. Okay, so now I've moved up to here. So this has all been turned up to here, this point. Still got some low points, so I'm going to have to come back to the, the base and pass over, but I'll just go a little bit over this corner now, and you'll hear the tool knocking a little bit. This is often where people start to get the tool digging in. If you keep following those arcs and just do a series of increasingly short and shallow arcs, you should be able to get around there without knocking or digging in too badly. Okay, so you can see here, I've gone all the way up to here now, all the way up to the edge, but I still need to come back and get over the whole thing, probably several, you know, several passes, just to take everything down to the lowest point of my axe marks here. I sh I'd also should point out that constantly while I'm doing this, I'm feeling for where that sweet spot is where it's cutting. So I bring the tool up till it's just cutting, and as I move slowly through an arc, through a, through a forward cut, the, the, the tool's moving forward through an arc or a, or a pass, I'm feeling, if it starts to feel like it's taking off too much, I can twist down slightly with the tool to make it less aggressive. Or if I feel like I'm running out of, if it's not engaging enough with the wood, I'll just make a very slight twist up as I'm going through that pass. It can be the case also that the arc isn't necessarily horizontal, that you're moving through a, a slight downward diagonal pass. So there's a lot of sort of subtle adjustments that you need to make as you go, just by feel, really. Um, and initially that's quite frustrating when you start turning because you'll, you'll get the tool biting in and digging unless, you know, suddenly clunk. That's usually a case of you're twisting up too much. Um, it can also be a case of you're having the tool too close to the surface of the wood. You need to line up that arc or, or judge just how far away the tool should be, especially when you've got lots of high points and low points from the axe work. You want to be just connecting with the tip, so not trying to take off too much wood at all, just knocking the high points off, very fine cuts. So I'll have another pass from the bottom here and go over.
can hear now it's starting to knock as I go around the corner again. Anytime you've got lots of knocky bits on these edges, it's good to slow down the forward travel speed. And that's the same for any time you're encountering um, high points that are knocking aggressively against the tool. As soon as you feel that start to happen, it's a good idea to slow down the forward travel speed. And by that, I mean the forward travel speed is the speed that you're moving the tool forward through that pass, through that arc. You're completely in control of that. If you're trying to move too fast, you can get into problems where you're trying to take off too much material, essentially, and you get a wall building up. Um, or you start knocking into high points. So if you slow down, if you, if you feel it knocking or biting off too much, you can keep the leg going, keep the leg moving, keep the revs up, but just stop the tool moving forward at all. Just leave it there where it's knocking and let it sort of, let it knock away what it's trying to work against. And only when you feel that that's, that's been um, cut away by the tool, then you slowly start to move forward again. So it's a, it's a bit like steering a car. You can slow down, speed up, steer into the cut to make it more aggressive, steer out of it by twisting. Hopefully, I don't know if you can see, but I'm, what I'm always trying to do is just to pick up a little tiny groove or wall, a very, very fine one, just ahead of the tool. And then I'm trying to push that all the way forward to the end of the cut. So I'm trying to stay behind that all the way. If you can keep the tool behind that, you'll have a nice, consistent cut over the surface. So now, I, I don't know if you can see, but I've got a little bit of a lip here. And you can sometimes find yourself with quite a big lip or a wall like that, which is quite difficult to, to, to get beyond. So if that happens, rather than stay in the same position, if you change the angle slightly, so you're going to sweep out just past that, just over the top of it, you'll end up with a sort of outward curve over that wall. And you can come back inside it again and do the same thing again until you've knocked it back enough for you to, to carry on where you were going. So I've got rid of most of the axe facets now. They're still a little bit down here. Um, so I might just take a little bit more out of there. And I'll probably just have one last pass over it now just to, just to smooth it all out a little bit. So I'll come back inside here. Now that I've got rid of the high points from the axe work, I can be a lot more, um, I can take much, much finer cuts, almost like smoothing cuts. So now I'm starting to look at the form of the bowl. Any ridges left by cutting arcs, I can now just start to smooth them out. The pulsing that I was talking about has got even sort of less um, pronounced, even less obvious, because I'm, it's much, much easier now to cut now that I've not got high points and low points. Going over a smooth surface like this is quite straightforward. I'm just trying to keep the back of the tool against the surface of the wood now and let the cutting edge find its way into that little groove which I'm pushing forward as a very fine wall all the way to the edge. So that's most of the axe. There's a tiny little axe facet there which I'm not going to worry about. I'm, going to, I'm just going to leave that as it is, I think. And what I'll do is um, start to do a little bit of work on the base. I'll show you how to create um, the base, how to cut in a little foot as well. So this is the tip-up tool, and I'm just trying, I'm going to try to explain for the camera the angle that I was using when I was shaping the back of the bowl then. And 
this piece of wood below the tool is only so that you can see the tool uh, clearly, hopefully. So this is not going to be the sur like, I'm not saying this is the surface of the bowl. But the tool here with the tip up at the sky is what I would call a horizontal position. If I twist like this with the cutting edge now pointing at the ground, that's, that's down. And if I twist up, the cutting edge is now up. So to begin with, when I started turning, to find the sweet angle, I had the cutting edge down like this, and the surface of the bowl would be my finger now, and it was just there, and I started spinning the bowl. And I started slowly, slowly making minute adjustments, twisting up, until it was about there, almost at the horizontal, it started to cut. And I twisted up a tiny bit more, just past the horizontal, so the cutting edge is now just starting to turn up ever so slightly, and that's where it was taking a nice fine cut. And pretty much all the way through, as I was doing all those sweeps, all those arcs, the cutting edge was at the same angle. As I got closer to the very edge of the bowl, the outside rim of the bowl, I was starting to twist up ever so slightly more. So the other thing I'd like to say, in addition to what angle I had the twist at, was the angle that the handle was at, the, the distance of the handle from my body when I was working on different parts of the bowl. I started off working on the base of the bowl here, just, just beyond the base, along the outside wall, and the handle was quite a long way from my body, so that the back of the tool was almost, not quite, but almost flat against the surface. I went through a series of arcs, each time moving the tool along the tool rest, and each time I lined up for another arc, I would bring the handle of the tool closer to my body before I began the arc, and during the arc, the handle moves away from me, because the cutting edge is moving forward. So I'd slide the tool along again, a little bit further, line it up for another pass, another arc. The handle comes closer to me again, and then I push the handle away through a series of pulsing movements moving through that arc, until I'm working on the very edge of the bowl, when I would actually change the grip slightly of my hand even. If it, if it feels more comfortable, you can do that. Bring the handle really close to your body, and you're working at this sort of position around the edge. Or you can hold it like this, so it's really important that as well as thinking about that twist, that rotation, finding the sweet, sweet angle, as you move around the curve of the back of the bowl, the handle is always moving closer towards you each time you line up for another pass. So now we come to looking at what we're going to do on the base of the bowl. And the, the most important thing really here is that we've got a metal spike. This centre is going straight into the bottom of the bowl. So we want to make sure that we don't have a hole in our bowl and to do that we need to create a little stub around the centre which is raised separate to the base and that's going to be cut away later on. Now I always do this at this stage. You could of course do this earlier and then shape the bowl. It's just the way that I've always done it. And um, So what I do though when I start shaping the base is I pick up my other tool. I'll, I'll use a tip down hook generally for this, especially when I'm teaching. Like I said earlier, you can use the same tool for all of this, but it's much better for some cuts to use different tools. And the reason, any time I'm creating a shape like a stub on the back here, or a foot, which I'm going to cut, a small foot I'm going to cut into the base of the bowl, um, or when I turn it around and I start creating the core, I like to use a tool where the tip is tucked underneath out of the way. If I have... Um, a tip up tool here and I start creating the stub, it can easily catch the top of the tool there and it could um, snag and tear out where I don't want it to or it could in a very extreme case break the tip of the tool off. So I've always just used the tip down tool here. And um, initially what I'm doing with this tool is I'm going to be cutting, I don't know if you can see that, I'm going to be cutting with the top part of the shoulder of the tool. So this part here. Let me just use my little, my little pointer. So I'm going to be using this part here, the top part of that shoulder. And I'm going to just hold the tool really still, get the treadle working, and that part there is going to be cutting deep, uh, slightly deeply just in one place, a little groove. And that's going to create this, the first initial beginnings of the stub around that centre. And to get that part to cut, to engage, I'm just going to be twisting slightly in, not overly, but just leaning in a little bit, so it's that part that's engaging and not anything else, not the bottom part of the hook. And then once I've created a little tiny channel there, I'm going to roll away slightly so the bottom part of the hook comes into contact with the, 
with the material slightly below the stub and that will scrape, make a scraping cut. As I lift the handle up, the tool will come down and I'll scrape a little flat, which is going to become tidying up the bottom of the bowl there. So if I show you that, a little distance from the metal centre, centimetre or so, I'm going to just start leaning in. The tool handle is at about 45 degrees to this centre line, the mandrel and the centre. So if that's the centre line, this is now lined up at about 45 degrees. And if you can see, I'm holding the tool in the crook of my arm. So I've changed the grip from this to this because I want a bit more stability here. So offering up that top edge of this tip down tool, centimetre below the spike at about, if this is a clock face, I'm cutting at about seven o'clock on the clock face. Just holding the tool still, you can see, hopefully you can see, that there's now a little groove around that stub. If I now twist my hand the other way, it brings the bottom of the hook into contact with the surface. And by lifting the handle up, each time I push the treadle down, just ever so slightly lifting the handle up each time like this and bringing the bottom part of the hook into the surface of the wood, I've now scraped a flat. I'll just do that again. And I'll do it one more time. So I'm going to lean in just underneath where I started the stub, same place, hold the tool still, just get the treadle working and then twist the tool so the bottom part of that hook connects with the surface of the wood. And that's a rough cut, it's not a nice finish. I'm gonna tidy that up in a minute with a different cut. But you can see now the stub is starting to appear separate from the base of the bowl, which means when we cut that away later, we won't have a hole in the bottom of the bowl. So I'll do that a little bit more, just to make the stub slightly more pronounced. The other thing that this is doing is beginning to create a slight concave in the base. And it's a good thing to do if you're turning a greenwood bowl, not to have a completely flat base, because if it warps as it dries, which it will, you could end up then having a wobbly base on the bowl. There's a bowl wobbles around a lot. If you make a slight concave here, you've got a better chance of the bowl sitting somewhere on that rim, the outside rim of that, and sitting more stable. Um, so I've just begun a concave by spending a little bit more time in the middle around the stub and just getting lighter with my cuts, so decreasing the contact with the tool against the surface as I get out to the rim, out to the edge. And that means that it's just slightly hollow there, ever so slight concave. But this is a rough surface because it's been scraped. So I'll now go back to my tip-up tool. And this is um, the one time, one of the few times where I would say you want to have the cutting edge pointing at the, at the sky, pointing up. So I've twisted from horizontal, I'm now offering it up exactly like this. But the back of the tool is going to be sitting against the surface of the wood, which is one of the key points. So back of the tool against the surface of the base, just inside the beginning of that base on, on the outside at about seven o'clock again, if that's a clock face, on a roughly seven o'clock position with the tool. And you can just start off just letting the tool rub on the back. And then from that position, if I put a slight bit of pressure on with my right hand, twisting in this way, I'm exaggerating now, I'm leaning in, not as much as that, but just a bit of pressure, the cutting edge on this tool will start to, will just start to connect and pick up the finest wispy shavings, which I'll chase in all the way, but stop before you get to that, that stub in the middle, because if you keep going, you'll catch that. It could rip it out. Or... So that's now got a nice smooth finish. I've, I've, it's, it was shaving rather than scraping, slicing rather than shaving. So I've got a nice smooth finish there and a slight concave, which is exactly what I want. And that's fine. You can leave your, your base as that. That's, that's fine for the base of the bowl. But what I like to do is make a little foot so that for your eye, visually, it just says that's the bottom of the bowl. And I do that again with the tip down tool. So I've swapped tools again. This is the tip down tool. And it's exactly the same technique I used for creating this stub because it's the same sort of shape I want to make, but just much, much finer, much smaller. So I'm going to offer the tool up 
leaning in slightly, twisting in slightly with my hand. So I'm cutting with the top part of the shoulder again, just like I did with the stub. At about seven o'clock on the base of the bowl, just on the outside of where I want the foot to be. I'm just going to hold the tool still, there's no forward movement, it's just holding it still in one place. And then a slight twist with my right hand, so the bottom of the hook comes into contact with the wood. And I'll just scrape slightly to blend that in with the rest of the bowl. And now visually your eye says that's, that's a little tiny foot, that's the bottom of the bowl. So Sharif, would you say the outside of the bowl is done now then? I'm happy with that now, yeah. Um, you know, you can, you can yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy to spin that round now. There's lots of little things that you can do. You know, you can take the tip down tool and put a couple of decorative grooves in, if you like, in the same way that we made a little foot there by offering this, um, this cutting edge up and just, just making a very fine little groove there and one next to it. You know, you can have little decorative sort of lines and grooves in there if you want, but essentially I'm happy with that now. So I'm going to take it off, spin it around, and um, what I'm going to do when I've spun it around, I'm going to replace this. So this is now going to be at this side. And I'm going to then cut a little chamfer here on the outside edge. There's all sorts of ways that you can do different things with the outside lip of the bowl. Um, I often make a little S curve, a very sort of subtle, delicate S type curve there, a little bead around the edge. But for a beginner's bowl, what I would say is just finish it with a simple chamfer. It's probably the easiest thing to do, so I'll show you how to do that. So it's twisting this round, what are some protocols people need to take? So obviously knock out the wedge, so freeze up this poppet. Do you want to keep your hand on the actual... Yeah, it's important to hang on to that, obviously, because if you take it off, this is under tension, it could go flying off. Well, not flying off, but it will, you know, fall off onto the floor. Um, and then, same thing again. The cord goes between me and the mandrel. I push away and to my left, over the mandrel, wrap it round, and then roll it down, locate it in that left-hand centre, and then tap that wedge back home again. I should have pointed out at the beginning the reason that I've got um, a right angle, a different, different centres. This one's just protruding a few inches out from the, this poppet. This poppet is lower and it's got a raised right angled bend. Um, that's purely so that I've got freedom of movement here when I'm shaping the back of the bowl. I can get all the way around here if I want to. When I'm, when I'm cutting the stub in, when I'm doing the foot, I've got plenty of room to move. If this poppet was high and the, and the metal centre was sticking out of there, it would be much more awkward. I could still do scraping cuts and you could still do some form of cutting in there, but it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to offer the tool up at the right angle, the correct angle, the same way I can when I've got more freedom of movement around here, around this centre. And I also use this when I'm turning end grain cups. Um, I not uh, most people don't do this, but I've always just found it easier to have the end grain, uh, the hollow end of the end grain cup here, and that allows me to get in there much more easily than if I had a mandrel uh, where I'm hollowing in a in a narrow cup. So that's another reason this comes into play. So I'm now what I'm doing is I've moved the tool rest slightly closer to the. Um, to the bowl. When I had the bowl on this side, I had to have this more open because the bowl was there and the tool rest was quite close to the bowl, which is what you want, so it's supported. Now that I've got the bowl over here, I'm moving that a bit closer so I haven't got, so that so the tool is supported still as as close as I feel comfortable to the, um, to the bowl, which will help with control, essentially. Now I've got a, a, a fairly uneven surface all around here. Um, but like I said, the first thing that I'm going to do is just cut in a chamfer 45 degrees across this corner, which will be the outside shape of my bowl. I use back to the tip-up tool, although you could use the tip-down tool for this equally well. There's not really much in it on this particular cut. Um, holding the tool horizontally just to begin the cut. And the angle of the tool is again about 45 degrees now to the centre to the centre line here. 
and I'm going to be sweeping across again another little arc but I've changed my grip with my hands so whereas I, earlier I had my two fingers hooked around the, the tool to support it and guide it here I've got my thumb underneath the tool rest and I've got all the fingers um, of my left hand my, my first finger is just resting on the tool rest helping to grip it with the thumb and the other fingers especially my little finger is coming into play to help guide and control the end of the tool. I'm holding the handle in the crook of my arm again. This feels more comfortable now than holding it like this for this part. And the tool is at the horizontal position, so I'm not twisting up or twisting down, but roughly horizontal. And I'll make fine little adjustments depending on how I feel it cutting. But I'm just going to sweep across just a tiny little bit across the edge there. Just a tiny little cut, and then I'm going to come back and cut a little bit more. And again, a little bit more. I don't know if you can see this, but I've actually I've twisted up slightly, so I'm now I've gone from horizontal to um, not quite 45 degrees twisting up. I just felt that's where it was cutting. So you just need to sort of feel into that a little bit yourself. Um, if you have a look at the bowl now, you can see I've got a chamfer going all the way around the edge. It's a little bit thin just at that point, so I'm gonna go a bit further. So yeah, I'm happy with that. So I've got a nice crisp edge. So with the chamfer now on the bowl, what's next? So now we're basically doing three things. We're essentially starting to hollow out all of the centre so that we have a hollow form. And while we do that, we're going to be creating the core, which is where the mandrel spikes go into the, uh, the blank, the bowl. We're going to create initially a similar shape to the mandrel, which is going to go in here. And then that's going to be cut so that it gets it tapers towards the bottom of the bowl, the inside of the bowl. It gets thinner and thinner until it's so thin that we can snap it off. Um, that's when the bowl's obviously finished. But we need to also um, establish our inside rim. We've got the outside chamfer sorted. We establish the inside rim and create a nice uh, uniform thickness of the inside wall as well. So we're doing sort of three or four things all at the same time, really. But essentially, we're hollowing. And there's all sorts of different ways that you can do this. The, uh, I'll show you um, a couple of different ways that you can use these two tools to get that hollow start process started. And, um, and I'm going to try and focus a lot on undercutting the core, which is something that a lot of people struggle with as well initially. So if I... What I usually do on one of my beginner's courses is, is I, I get people to smooth out any, any sort of um, rough surface left by the axe work up here on the face. It's not absolutely essential, but it doesn't hurt to do because the more uniform it is, everything's just going to get easier. So what so, tool are you using? So I'm using my tip-up tool now, which is the one that's used for most of the process. And I'm just going to flatten off this face. You can just start right in here and, and sort of, um, you know draw the tool along to flatten this off but if you've got a really this is pretty smooth if you've got a really badly roughed out surface it can be quite hard work knocking all the time high points and low points so to make it easier i break it up into small sections with people and i'll say usually start at this edge have a little sweep like an arc still working in arcs a little arc like that just over the edge and once i've done one pass over the edge a small section i'll move the tool back towards the center of the bowl by a centimeter or so and have another pass over that whole section that I've just done until I come right off the edge and move it back again a centimetre or so closer to the centre of the bowl and pass over that entire section. And the reason I'm passing over the entire section is just to keep it flat and uniform. If I just do lots of little sections, I'll have lots of ups and downs, you know. And again, the reason I'm doing it, I, the reason I encourage people when they're starting to do this in small sections is just to make it easier for yourself so you're not going over a whole lot of rough stuff at the same time. You clear a bit ahead of you and then do a little bit more and then it's all clear all the way do a little bit more and then you've got a lot of clear stuff to get through so and what angle is that so i'm starting again at horizontal more or less horizontal 
and then just twisting up ever so slightly until I feel it starts to cut. So, so just past the horizontal, it's cutting quite nicely. Moved it back, going forward through an arc. I also, I, I find that what, the direction I'm usually moving in when I do this is slightly diagonally down with the hook tool. So I'm, lift, I'm pushing the handle away from me and slightly up, so bringing the cutting edge slightly diagonally down. You could think of it as moving from more or less 7 o'clock, imagine a line going from the mandrel at 7 o'clock on the mandrel to 7 o'clock on the outside edge. I'm sort of following that 7 o'clock diagonal line. That's the forward direction of the tool. If you find that this is a struggle holding the tool in this way and it's moving around a lot, you can rest the tool in the crook of your elbow like that and that gives you a lot more support, a lot more strength leverage wise. You might have to lean your body slightly forward and slightly out to the sides. But that surface is now completely ironed out of any axe marks or roughness all the way, almost all the way to the mandrel. So now that I've got all that tidied up and I know where I am with that surface, I'm going to start hollowing and I, I usually do that with the tip down tool because while I'm hollowing I'm also beginning making the very first beginnings of the core which will later be snapped out. And this is essentially exactly like making the stub on the back of the bowl that we just did. It's the same tool, tip down tool, it's the same technique, same angles, everything's the same. We're leaning in ever so slightly with the top edge, that top shoulder of the tip down tool, just beginning to cut in slightly with that. And then rolling out slightly so the bottom of the tip down hook starts to scrape, lifting the handle up so just clearing a section away beneath that groove that you're cutting in. So I'll just show you how that works. So a centimetre or so from the mandrel, leaning in, twisting in with the top shoulder. You can see it's creating that groove and then twisting out. So I'm now rolling my hand out so the bottom of that hook starts to connect with the surface of the wood below that groove. And just scraping, scraping a flat. And you can see that I've created a very little stub and started to make a very slight concave. And once again, are you following the same principle of going seven to seven, seven o'clock, seven o'clock? Yeah, well, essentially I'm going, yeah, slightly diagonally downhill from seven o'clock here, leaning in again, going a bit deeper, twisting out. It's, it's a little bit more straight down than diagonally along that seven o'clock line with this tool. It's just lifting the handle up. But what, what it's doing is it's giving me a hollow here. And that's, that's something then that I can start working with. What, what is the easiest way to work in any direction is downhill when you're cutting. So if I make it easy for myself by creating a low point, I can then come back with either tool, usually the tip-up tool I use for this, start at the top of that slope here, and then work downhill, and come back a little bit further, work downhill again work back a little bit further, work downhill again. Sort of the opposite of what I did when I was flattening out the surface here, just starting just on the edge of that slope and pushing it down and then coming back a bit further to the outside edge and then moving forward again. So I'll show you how that works. So this is my tip up tool again now that I've picked up. And I'm the angle that I want, the back of the tool I want sitting flat against the surface so again, you could just start with the tool rubbing on the back, not cutting. And if I twist with my right hand to bring that cutting edge just into contact with the surface of the wood at the top of that slope that I've created, it'll just start to cut. Now, 
Now, what I was doing then was a slight pulsing up and down. I don't know if you, if you picked that up on the camera, but it's a very subtle movement up and down, that pulsing. So I'll, I'll just repeat that again. I'm coming slightly further back out to the edge of that cut. So in time with my downward treadle, as I push down, the tool comes up. As I push down, the tool comes up. And then the, when I lift my foot up off the treadle, the tool comes uh, away again. So, so far I'm going downhill. As soon as I start to go uphill again, so uh, this section around the mandrel is now flaring out a bit like a, a trumpet or something, which means that as I get closer to that, the tool starts wanting to go uphill and then it will dig in and bite, which you want to avoid. So I can keep coming to the edge of this slope, working down to that point where it flares out around the mandrel, and I keep working back again and again and again until I start getting more hollowed, but stopping always before I reach the flare. But eventually I need to get rid of this flaring out. So I reach for the tip down tool again. And this is where I begin shaping what's gonna become the core. And this is the beginning of undercutting the core, creating that shape. So offering up the edge of the tip down tool, twisting in slightly with my right hand to bring that top shoulder into contact with that flaring shape. I've got the hook tool in the crook in my arm and I'm just going to start cutting here and then, and then following that flare down. You should be able to catch it on the camera. So essentially the back of the tool is resting against the, the core? It is. The back of the tool is registering. That's, that's my reference point. The back of the tool is registering against that slope, that flaring out, which is going to become the core. So I'll start that cut again. It's getting less flared each time I repeat that. As long as the back of the tool keeps registering each time against the surface of that, of that core, the angle's gonna be just right. I'm cutting at about seven o'clock on that core as well. If the tool isn't too far forward, I'm not cutting at six o'clock underneath there, underneath the center. I'm not up here at nine o'clock. I'm just at about seven o'clock on that core. Okay, now there's another thing you can do with a tip down tool, rather than reaching for the tip up tool straight away, is I can use the tip up, tip down tool in a similar way to the other tool, where I'm resting the bottom of the hook against the surface, the sloping surface here, and actually take a slicing cut rather than a scraping cut. If I'm holding it horizontally like this and twist slightly, that's going to start scraping, which is what I've been doing, on, which is what, what I did initially on the back of the bowl there, so sort of smoothing scraping cut. If I hold it this way, that's going to actually properly cut and slice. So to open up this hollow even further, I can do what I just did, create a bit of a groove by scraping there, and then with the tip down tool, rest it on its nose essentially. And cut in there, I just, just caught the, the core there. So I've twisted again to horizontal, so I'm cutting the, the core now. shaping the core, stopping it from flaring out, and then twisting around so the bot so the nose of this tool is just rubbing on the surface here, this slope, and then lean in till it starts to cut. So again, just, it's another way of excavating around this hollow. Essentially what I want to do now is start to 
remove the bulk of this material. Now I've got a nice hollow here. I can quite easily just get on and starting at the top of that slope, working down, coming back to the top of the slope again, working down, all the time getting closer and closer to this edge, just starting to excavate. So I'll just have several repeated passes now. Again, rubbing the back of the tool, this is the tip-up tool, just rubbing it on the back just to establish what angle I want to go into to take a nice cut, and rolling in ever so slightly, just a subtle change of direction with my right hand, until the tool starts to cut. And then chasing that groove all the way down. So I've now got this flaring out again. Okay, so I've picked up my tip up tool, uh, sorry, my tip down tool again, because I'm gonna be working on the core. I'm gonna do a bit more work taking out this, um, this core and this where it's flaring out at the bottom there. So I've, I've opened up this angle because this flaring out is quite a, a shallow wide angle. Well, it's quite a, quite a wide angle here. So I just want to... I'm going to run the tip down tool along that flared out shape. And I'm cutting with the tip down tool now with the very front slightly from the middle to the slightly from the middle to the sort of lower section of that tip down tool. So this sort of section here I'm I'm cutting with now. opening up that in there a little bit and now I'm going to have a run down the core so again I don't know if you can see but I've tucked this uh, handle under my arm now because the core is starting to become more established and I find it's good to have a lot of really solid control over the tool whenever you're working on the core at this stage if I'm holding it like this or like this it's very easy for the uh, the cutting edge to be grabbed as the core spins away and you uh, cause a, you know, you cut a deep sort of channel or it scars, it runs off, it runs up onto the mandrel or something. So you want a lot of control. Locking this handle with, your, my, with my arm against the side of my body helps to keep that really solid. And I've got a firm grip here as well with my hand. Um, my thumb is underneath. All the fingers of, of my left hand are called into play to really lock that tool tight against the tool rest. And I'm offering the cutting edge up at seven o'clock by keeping the back of the tip down tool against, completely flat against the surface of the mandrel. I'm not twisting up at all initially. I just want to get it rubbing in that position. And then it's the slightest angle upwards. So twisting with my right hand to bring the cutting edge just in, only very subtly against the mandrel, uh, against the core. And it starts to cut. And once I've got that groove, once I can see that the cutting edge has picked up a, a groove like that, 
all the, my, my job is just to hold the tool still, really, at that place, and it will find its own way in. I keep my leg going, I just keep the tool behind that groove and allow the cutting edge to work to chase down that core. You need to be careful of the, um, the proximity of this, of the tool into the rim of the bowl. And the reason for that is if I'm too far out here, if I've got this sort of angle when I'm running on chasing the core down, I've got all of this cutting edge which is going to be coming into contact with the core as it spins. So there's a lot for it to catch. And that's going to be too aggressive and it'll keep digging in and biting. So I don't want to be open at this angle with the handle away from me when I'm working on the core. I really want to be like this with the tool as straight on as possible whenever I'm working on the core. Almost, you know, almost 90 degrees to the centre line here. That's almost straight on. Back of the tool, referenced, registering against the core at seven o'clock position. Get it rubbing. Lean in a little bit with the cutting edge and it just starts to bite. There you go, you can see it now cutting. And now I just need to stay behind that groove and chase it down. And I'm only moving my body and the tool handle slightly away now just to keep clearance of the rim. And you can see now I'm scraping with the bottom of the tip down hook in the base of the bowl just to open it up a little bit, create a bit of space. Okay, so you can see what I've done now. I've, the, the core has become a bit like the mandrel. It's starting to taper ever so slightly. You don't want to get this too thin until you've got your inside rim established and your inside wall almost completely finished. Because if it gets too thin, as it starts to get really thin when you're going to snap it out, it starts to wobble. And when that happens, you'll never be able to get a nice finish on the inside wall or your rim, because there'll be movement. So I'm going to do a little bit more just at the bottom of that core, just in the base, just to create a bit more space. So using that technique I showed you of going from this position to this position, with the tip down tool, from horizontal to vertical, just to open things up a bit in there. Just check where I am thickness wise. So now what I'm going to do is establish my inside, uh, my lip here and start to get my, close to my finished thickness at this point and do anything that I want to do with shaping this inside rim. So I'll go back to my tip up hook. I found that the tip down hook, doing anything at the rim with the tip down hook is asking for trouble because it can easily catch. So tip up tool. Anything I do... Uh, inside rim area here to begin the cut you're completely unsupported with the tool the tool is just sort of in the air you've got to offer it up where you want to cut but it's not supported and it can run off catch you know run on the outside so you just need to be very careful so I, I like to lock it against my body with my hand here the tool hold it really tightly there get everything stable you don't want your upper body to be moving at all all that moves is your leg and if you offer the tool up so it's just rubbing on the back, then it does have something to register on. If you start straight away cutting in, it's quite free. You can, you can do it like that, but it's risky. Whereas if you have the back of the tool just rubbing on the outside and you start to roll over, it's a little bit safer. So... What you do need to be careful of as you're cutting here, as you go in, is not to catch any part of this tool on the rim. So you can just move the tool slightly further forward. Rather than working up here and going in, just work down here. It gives you a bit more clearance. So you 
starting literally just on the inside lip of the chamfer. Basically. Just on the inside lip. Now what happens sometimes is this can get a bit thin. You can end up with a bit of a, like a, 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 an edge. And that is extremely difficult to do anything with because an edge, trying to land on an edge with the edge with the hook, with the cutting edge is going to ask for disaster. It'll catch it, it'll rip, it'll spin out. So if you've got that problem, you've, got, you've gone too thin there, you can just scrape a little flat on. It doesn't have to be marked, that's enough. All it needs to be is a tiny amount scraped in. And then you've got a flat. And you can register the back of the tool on that flat and cut in again like that. So you've got a nice inside lip again. Um, I'm going to start just inside that slight inside bevel now that I've created. Get the tool rubbing on the back, back of the tool just rubbing, and then lean in a little bit more so it just starts to cut. And you can see that's going to be my finished rim thickness pretty much just there. So I'll follow that groove, I'll put the tool back into that groove now, follow that in. So something else that I'm doing now, um, when, I'm, when I've got this whole curve, I've got a bump in the middle which I'm going to take out there, but when I've got a whole um, pass to do on the inside wall, it's really important to make adjustments with the right hand to keep the angle uh, the same. Uh, or sorry, or not to, not to leave the angle the same, but to, to constantly be adjusting the angle as you follow that curve. Um, and what I mean is, the, the ideal angle for this is the back of the tool sitting flat against that surface. So sitting like that, not like that or like that, but sit, sitting really flat. And because it's a curved shape, when I start here and it's registering flat on the back of the tool, my hand is in this position. As I move in towards the inside of the bowl, if I left my hand in that same position rigidly, the back of the tool would start to come up away from the edge and it would start to get really aggressive and chattery. It wouldn't be a nice finish at all. So as I go in deeper, I'm constantly twisting this hand from here to there like that. It's that movement. It's rotating from there. When I get to the very centre of the bowl, it's twisted all the way around and what's happening with the cutting edge is it's going from this position and it ends up near the mandrel, near the core rather, almost pointing vertically against the surface of the bowl as it points towards the core. So if you, I don't know if you can catch that on the camera, but so here this is rubbing on the back, leaning in a little bit just to get it to bite. So I've started twisting my hand now. I can see the cutting edge coming up. And now the cutting edge is almost pointing up at the ceiling. So from there, from there, it's gone round like that. And I do that with my right hand. That keeps the cutting angle sweet all the way, and you should get a nice finish all the way all the way through there. Okay, so we're getting somewhere now. Um, With that, I'm still doing this pulsing technique. So you can probably hear that in time with my downward treadle, I'm bringing the tool forward. When, as soon as I lean in with the, with the cutting edge and it starts to engage, I get a little tiny groove. I then stay behind that groove, but the tool comes away and back. It's a very subtle movement, like I said earlier, just enough to get it to bite nicely each time and, and knock that groove a bit further forward each time.
So I'm still going through an arc. I've still got a pivot point here. And I'm going tap, 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 but it's going tap, tap, tap through an arc. So all of that from there to there, there was no forward movement. The tool wasn't sliding forward at all. That was all just one arc, like that. That's the movement that I was making. And it's only when I get to this point, and I'm almost you know, right at the, near the bottom of the bowl, that I need to start sliding this tool forward. So I'm sliding it through my hand to get a bit further. So that's one arc. And then I start now sliding it forward. So I'll do that once more. Starting to slide it forward now. And again, stopping before I get to that flared out section there. So I'm going to do a bit more work now on the core. I'm getting close to where I want to be with this, uh, this wall thickness now. It feels nice and even. It's still a little bit thicker here in the base, so I'll take a bit more out of there. But I don't want to get too close to my finished uh, thickness in the base until I've done a bit more work on the core because those two things go together. I'll chase the core down a bit and then blend that in with the base a little bit. Take the core down a bit more thinner, blend that in with the base. And if I go too thin initially with the base, then I'm not going to be able to blend it in. I'll end up with a strange sort of flat at the bottom of the bowl rather than a nice curve all the way through. So again, working on the, on the core, locking my arm against my body, which one is this uh, tip? This tip is the down. tip down tool. Yeah. Any shape that is like this, sort of um, cylindrical, stubby shape, the stub on the back, the foot, the core, I do all of that with the tip down hook. Offering the back of the tool up completely flat against that surface, which is now slightly at an angle because it's starting to taper. So at seven o'clock on the core, that seven o'clock position, not, not higher up at nine or lower down at six, just on the edge at seven. Getting it rubbing on the back and then twisting my right hand just to bring the cutting edge into contact. You can just hear it starting to whisper now. It tells you it's cutting. I've got the, the tool quite straight on, almost at 90 degrees. Not quite at 90, but almost at 90 degrees to the center line. Because like I said, if I have it too much out here, it's gonna be too much of that edge surface connecting as the as the core spins around it'll keep catching so offer up less to catch by bringing the handle closer into you good firm hold under my arm good firm hold on the tool rest tool against the tool rest and then just stay behind that groove don't there's no there's very little forward movement i am doing a slight i'm doing a, i'll exaggerate this now an up and down pulsing so I'm doing this, as I push down on the treadle, the tool comes up against the surface. When the treadle comes up, the tool comes away. It's very subtle, but it just helps the tool to, to engage for each cut. Moving my body out now slightly to stop the tool rubbing on the rim. And starting to just turn away some of that flare. Okay, so I'll just check to see how I'm doing with the thickness. Yep, let's get in there. So I'll have another couple of passes down the core. You can 
see it's starting to get a little bit thinner now. Starting to see that taper a bit more pronounced. What's the maximum in terms of width you would go to of the actual uh, stem, the core? Well, you want it to be able to snap easily. Um, I think, uh, you, you know, you could get to about an inch it should snap, but I tend to go thinner than that, ideally. Um, so just to show you another technique you can do with the inside wall before this gets any thinner now. Um, as well as chasing down the inside wall with the tip up tool, you can use the tip down tool and just use the, the bottom part of that hook. As long as it's sitting flat on that part of the hook when it's in that position, you can get a nice slice along the inside wall. You can do quite a nice fine smoothing cut. Very similar to the way the tip very similar to the way the tip up tool works. Okay, so that's looking very, very nearly there now, Zed. So, have a look at everything, check I'm happy with it all. Might do a tiny bit more out here, just smooth down some of these tool marks from earlier. So I'm happy with that. So the last thing to do now is just take final run down on the core, just to get that a little bit thinner. There's a slight upward slope on the bottom actually, I'll just take a bit more of that out. Tip down hook again, of course. And I usually try to make the um, I usually try to make the thinnest part of the core slightly higher than the base of the bowl, just so that you can see it's starting to wobble now. Just so that if the um, if the base of the bowl is a little bit on the thin side, for example, if you go too close to the base of the bowl, where it's going to snap, it can pull out some of the fibres. So soon as you want to leave a stub either side. You want to leave a little stub either side and have the thinnest part slightly higher than the base of the bowl. Yeah. So I'm pretty confident now that that's going to. Well, there's no doubt at all now that that's going to snap above the bowl. So, Mr. Adams, is, it, is this the moment of truth? You could say that, perhaps, yeah. Shall we take it off the lathe? And Let's do it. So, what protocols do we take once again? So, again, holding on to the mandrel so it doesn't fly off as you release the tension here. <coughs> Tap the wedge. You need to be careful with this. Obviously, you can, this can go flying out and catch you unawares if you're not careful. So, you need to be, be aware of that. Loosen that off. Take that off the lathe, and now it's just a simple matter of snapping it against the grain. So fibres are running this way in the bowl, 
So I'm going to hold it here with one hand, hold it there with the other hand. Just give it a little snap. And that's what's left. We'll tidy that scar up with a little knife. We'll tidy that up with a knife on the back there as well. The bowl is born. So Sharif. Zed. So the bowl is off the lathe. It is indeed. So what's the final stage we're doing here? So I'm going to take a knife, and some people use uh, dedicated special made bottoming knives for this, but I just use a spoon knife. This is my very old trusty Hans Carlson spoon knife, which has got really worn away over the years from repeated sharpenings. And I've got the fibres now running this way, horizontally across, and I use the side of my finger against the back of this blade, thumbs out of the way, and I use this grip and a bit of support and guidance from the side of this finger on my left hand. And I usually start cutting away the stub on the back of the bowl, just because if you have used any lubrication at all there, that's where it gets all mucky. It can get your clothes mucky if you do the other side first. It can get muck all over the bowl. Is this talking from experience? This is, yes, <laughs> you know it is. And this, I've just flipped it through 180 degrees, so the grain's still going horizontally. You want to be cutting across the grain with this knife. And this is where it's really interesting. You suddenly realise just what an efficient machine the lathe is and how efficiently the tools cut. Because cutting this wood with a spoon knife, you realise it's actually quite hard work. And when it's, when it's on the lathe and the shavings are flying, when everything's right with your technique and everything, it's just so effortless, really. It's, um, it's a very, very efficient way of making wooden bowls. So are there precautions to be taken when shaping, when kind of flattening this out as you're doing now? Yeah, uh, you want to be careful that you don't slip with a knife and, and ruin the foot that you've created, for example. So you just need to, be, that's why with this hand, I, although I'm, I'm using this technique, I'm doing a lot of the guiding with, with the, the side of this hand. So I'm not pulling up too hard where I'm going to slip. There's almost a little bit of resistance with this hand, sort of uh, holding back slightly. So that's as, that's as far as I would go with the, the base of the bowl like that. So you don't, you don't want to go too concave, basically? No, that's right. The, that's a very good point. You don't want to go too thin just in case the base is a bit too thin and you end up going through. But as long as you've been checking the, the wall thickness with your fingers as you've been turning. Another thing you can do, until you get the feel of how thin things are with your fingers, if you've got a, a, a light, a torch in your phone or something, you can shine that through the bowl and you should be able to see, you should be able to see light coming through if it gets too thin. I'm a bit of a fan of turning thin bowls. This one's actually quite heavy compared to some of the ones I usually turn. But if you can see light coming through when the wood is green because it's translucent, that's not the end of the world. But you don't want to see, you don't want to see through it. You know, you don't want a window. So the inside stub, I'm, um, I've got running vertically now the grain, and I sort of adopt this type of as if I'm going to disembowel myself type grip with the thumb on the side of the blade, and cradling the bowl there with that hand against my body vertically and pushing on the side of the blade with my thumb and this hand again is sort of a bit like a pivot point so I'm guiding with my thumb and drawing in a little bit but there's resistance with this hand my right hand so I don't want to go sliding into the side of the bowl just cutting across the grain again Spun it round through 180 degrees to get the other side. And needless to say, people will use just whatever spoon knife they have. Yeah, so. yeah, it doesn't need to be anything special at all. As long as you've got a curved blade that will get in there. That's it. That's that. Job done, really. So, Sharif, do you have any tips on drying? Yes, um, you want to avoid drying uh, a greenwood bowl too quickly because it will crack. So the slower you can dry, the better within reason. If it dries too slowly, of course, like in a bag for too long, it could start to go mouldy. So what I usually advise people to do um, is to wrap their freshly turned bowl in something like a T-shirt or, or a tea towel or a piece of cloth 
and just leave it somewhere for 24 hours, at which point that material will feel quite damp because of the moisture that's being uh, lost from the wood. So that allows the moisture to leave the bowl, but keeps it close so it's not leaving too quickly, it's not drying too fast. After 24 hours, remove that damp cloth or that damp t-shirt and put a dry piece of material around it. Leave it for another 24 hours. That's just the safest way um, that I've found of slowly drying a bowl. And after a few days, when the, when the material no longer feels damp after you've changed it, um, you can then um, just leave it in a room somewhere. And I usually leave it just sort of leaning up on a bookshelf or something like that, just so that the air can get around it. Um, yeah, just dry it nice and slowly. Don't leave it near a sunny window. Don't put it near a wood burner or a radiator. Just allow nature to take its course and you'll feel when it's dry, it'll feel much lighter. You tap it, it won't, it'll sound, it'll sort of ring more than, than it sounds when it's wet. And uh, at that point you can then choose to oil it if you like. And I, uh, a lot of people use flaxseed oil like they would for a spoon. I've recently started using walnut oil. Um, you just need to be careful if you use walnut oil to make sure that you're selling bowls. You need to um, let people know that it's been oiled with walnut oil and nut oil. But I prefer the smell of walnut oil and I prefer the, um, the look as well. It doesn't go, there's a tendency for a lot of flaxseed to go quite yellowy sometimes and I found walnut oil doesn't have that effect. So yeah, and then you just enjoy your bowl. So would you let it dry first and then apply the oil? Um, yeah, definitely. I, would, uh, I always let my bowls dry first and then apply the oil. And with the oil, you would just simply apply it on and then would you just then leave that for another, what, week, two weeks or...? Well, I mean, the thing is, really, for, 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 for an oil like that to cure, to polymerise, it can take months. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't allow that process. I don't let the oils cure properly. I, um, I oil them so that the grain, the, the, the grain is brought out and I probably will leave them for... Uh, you know, a week or so, 10 days. Um, and then in use, you know, they develop their own sort of um, pattern, you know, with, with, with use and with the food that you cook in them and the natural oils in the food. If you want to, after some time, you want to re-oil them again, you can do, of course. But um, I once did leave a plate that I had turned oiled and I sort of um, just forgot about it for a year or so and it was quite amazing. The finish on it was... Um, like nothing I'd ever seen before, and it still to this day hasn't changed, hasn't washed away. It's it was really like protected, like almost like a varnish. That was with flaxseed oil that had just been left for a year, you know, curing. But most of the time, I don't bother. Lastly, and this is kind of more of an observation on my part, and I think this applies to a lot of crafts in general, uh, also across green woodworking. Uh, but I've found that by procuring other people's work, so for example, in this case, a bowl. Um, made from you know, people like yourself or whoever else, there are many other bowl turners that are out there. Um, would you, in your experience, agree that you know by acquiring other people's work, it gives you a lot of inspiration by holding something in your hand um, to see the form, to see thin, uh, the thinness, the the kind of um, the overall shape, etc., uh, to give you inspiration for your own work? Yeah, I think it's a really good idea to buy one of my bowls. No, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's a really good idea, said to buy, whether it's a spoon, you're buying a spoon from the different makers or bowls from different makers, anything you're interested in making, if you buy, not only then do you have a 3D model, it's one thing seeing something in a photograph, but being able to pick something up, feel how it sort of, how it sings in your hand, you know, some bowls that are turned really nicely, you know, nice and thin, have got a sort of, uh, sort of, it's difficult to describe, but they, they just feel so different to a, a heavy, thick bowl. And, and um, yeah, having something there that you can turn over in your hand, look at, you can look at the form, the shape, the finish, the little details like how the, you know, the, the inside rim, the outside rim, it's a really worthwhile thing to have. And there's lots of people turning amazing bowls at the moment all around the country, all around the world. So there's plenty of people to choose from. And if you're going to turn a couple of bowls yourself, I would definitely recommend buying one or two from people who have been doing it for a while, just so you've got something there to know what you're aiming for. So there you go, my friends. That is a wrap for this amazing tutorial. Sharif, I cannot thank you enough. It's been a pleasure, Zed. The pleasure it's has been, been all my... It sincerely has. Like I said, I spent the past two days at the time of recording this video with Sharif on the first day of Forced and Tools, on the second day of uh, Turn My Own Bowl. Um, 
And so I have a, a great sense of gratitude to Sharif to allow me into his workshop, into his space, to share his process that he's taken many, many years to refine. And he's talked to countless people, a lot of whom have become you know, a lot of top turners now uh, in the UK and abroad. So it would mean the world to me, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, that first and foremost, we have done a first part to this series that you're watching now, which is a complete beginner's guide to this whole art of bolt turning, which covers in depth, like we said, the topics of the lathe, the tools, the wood selection, etc. So there will be a link to that below. I would highly encourage you to watch that if you haven't done so. This uh, video following on from this particular video is looking at the sharpening of the actual tools that Sharif was using and subsequently you'll be using if you are now or going to be in the future turning your own bowls. So if that video is out by the time you're watching this video, once again, a link will also be to that down below in the description. Also, we've mentioned a blog post. We keep referring to this one blog post that Sharif is compiling as an ongoing project that is containing obviously all the videos you're watching now and all the relevant information that has been discussed within those videos. So any questions that you have pertaining to wood, the tools, the lathe, etc., uh, I would highly encourage you to check out the link below that will take you to his blog post that contains all those relevant links. Also, it would mean the world to me. You see, Sharif teaches this full time. This is his actual profession. So the mere fact he's allowed me to come and document this for you guys to watch um, means a whole lot to me and hopefully means a lot to you. And all I ask is one thing, that if you gain any value from this video and this series whatsoever, is that when you go and check out these blog posts down below, to also join his newsletter, which you need to enter your name and your email, and he'll be keeping you updated on everything he has going on. He does some amazing stuff here in Dartmoor at his workshop and elsewhere around the country, so he'll be updating you on that too. So it would mean the world to me for you to do that. Also, secondly, I'll put a link to his Instagram down below. And on his Instagram, you can see a visual representation of all the work that he's getting up to uh, from before and obviously up until now. So it would mean the world to me. Check those two links out to his blog post and his Instagram. Um, and once again, I cannot thank you enough. You know, it means a lot to me that he's allowed me to come here and share this uh, process with you guys. Because I don't think currently at the time of putting this video out, there's that much of an in-depth video uh, that's gone into the precise detail that Sharif has covered in this video. So, on that note, Sharif, do you have any parting words? Uh, well, just to say that it's been a real pleasure having you here for a few days, Ed, it really has. Um, getting to know you a little bit better, I won't talk too much about what I've learned about you because I wouldn't want you to get arrested, but um, <laughs> um, it has been a real pleasure and uh, I just really genuinely hope it's been of some use to people who are maybe um, can't get to a course or haven't been to a course yet who'd like to try bowl turning. There is an awful lot going on with bowl turning, even for a, a video like this, it's not possible to cover everything, but I hope it's enough to get people started. And what I have found over the years with people who've been on courses is an, an introductory, uh, introduction to bowl turning day is really just the very beginning. And I find people go away then and they start having a go on their own, turning their first solo bowls. And that's when the real questions start to arise in people's minds. When you first come for a day, it's, it's very overwhelming. There's a lot of information, lots of different angles, tool angles, techniques, positions with a tool you need to hold. And it can be very overwhelming. Um, so I encourage people to use this video just to have a go and to try for a little while. And then maybe if you can get some tuition after that point, I find that that tuition will then be so much more valuable than going through a lesson uh, and then going away trying for a few months and coming back to have another lesson when you're really ready to ask the right questions and to receive the right information. Um, so yeah, that's all I'd like to say really, is just to get stuck in, enjoy it, it's great fun, you make lovely bowls, and uh, I wish you all the best with it, everybody. Yeah, yeah and I think you reminded me of one thing actually, is obviously in this video we've endeavoured our absolute best to show you all the dynamics of you know turning your, hopefully your first bowl. Uh, but obviously there's only so much you can show in the video format and nothing will be obviously learning from person be it from Sharif or anywhere else you know it doesn't matter there's lots of people yeah teaching there's many people that are out there are teaching here in the UK and elsewhere uh, across the world so I cannot stress enough and this is from someone who's speaking just literally yesterday at the time I recorded this video turning my first bowl and I know without a shadow of a doubt I've got my lathe uh, behind me and I know over the next kind of two three four months I'm going to be turning away uh, and without a shadow of a doubt, you know, with Sharif's permission, I'll be coming back to see him pester him once more in Dartmoor uh, and, and coming back with a lot more questions, just like you said. Um, so the key thing is there is hopefully this video is part of this process now for your uh, bowl turning journey. And do not be afraid to give it a go. You're going to run into issues. That's a given. But from those 
uh, issue that you arise upon, and obviously we're going to be learning from those and progressing on. And I'll tell you what, the buzz uh, at the end of yesterday when I cracked open my first bowl, that was great. It's good fun. That was it's fantastic. Fun. It was a real buzz. And it, it's just time on the lathe. You know, pe people who, who get good at doing anything only get good at it because they put the hours in. It's the same with anything. My, my mum has started doing some painting courses and her teacher is a very good painter, always says to his students, it's all about, people say, how can I be as good as you at painting? And he always says, it's just time on the brush. And it's exactly the same with this. The time you spend on the lathe, the more hours you put in, the better you will get. It's as simple as that. It's a whole concept of the 10,000 hours uh, from Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, uh, well, interestingly, I, I was talking to someone that said, apparently that's from a Japanese, that's from... Uh, it, it is, yeah, so the principle goes yeah, back a, yeah. a very long time. In terms of the modern era, Malcolm Gladwell, we're going off at a tangent here, yeah. that conversation, but it's all relevant. Yes, yeah, so Malcolm Gladwell, uh, he studied, it's a book called Outliers, the oh, New yeah. York Times bestseller. And what he did was he looked at people across multiple industries, from crafts to music, sports, business, etc., and what he found was the number one commonality between all the top players, and I'm talking the creme de la creme of every single space and industry, was they put in a minimum of 10,000 hours into their discipline. Mm -hmm. you know? So regardless of all the external factors, such as their education, their economic status, where in the world they are, etc., the one thing that was, a, without a doubt, a consistent commonality and the single most commonality between all of them mm -hmm. was the fact they put in a minimum of 10,000 hours into their particular discipline. Right, you know? interesting. Yeah. So nothing trumped that. So once again, people can argue they're born with a silver spoon in their mouth or they've got a natural talent. Yeah. These are things that are kind of here or there. But the one thing is a commonality based on the actual research in the book. Um, and just common sense will dictate to you that it was those hours that it's were put It's the time in. you put in with anything. That's the way. Here's That's the, the way. Get a good basic uh, foundation and technique and... And, uh, and that'll stand you in good stead, yeah, for sure. Fantastic, there we go. We ended off on a philosophical note there. I feel quite intelligent now, shall we? I just feel scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. Once again, we know it's a long video, but as you can see, this is a very lengthy process with so many nuances. So, as we mentioned before, there is a timeline below taking you to all the relevant sections. We hope you got the value from this video. Please do go check out the links below to this, this series as a whole to the blog post that Sharif has very kindly written up containing all the information you're gonna need. And also within that blog, if you do very kindly join up to Sharif's newsletter, that would mean the world to me. That's your way of saying thank you to Sharif uh, for you know, sharing his uh, uh, process that he's taken many years to refine. And also a link to the Instagram profile of Sharif Adams and it will mean the world to me if you connect with him there also. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this video. Sharif, a sincere thank you once again. Happy days. Nice one, Zed. So, Hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to seeing you on the next part of this series where Sharif Adams is going to be teaching you how to sharpen the tools. Hope you enjoyed this video and as always, we hope whatever you do, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. Zed with his bold gangster hat and from Sharif Adams, peace out.